So welcome everybody to the next installment of the Our Crowd Teach in Tuesday. Uh, we do these twice a month, typically on the second and fourth Tuesday of the month. Um, we talk about all different things that relate to startup investing, whether it's trends in certain industries, or actually about the startup uh, investing process in general. Tonight's going to be something more about the startup uh, process in general. It's about the investing uh, models that we use here at OutCrowd, how you end up making money. We're calling this Cashing In, How to Make Money Investing in Startups. If you're joining us and you have questions or you have to leave early, a few of you have asked uh, if this, this presentation will be available later. It will be. Uh, we'll send out an email either tomorrow or the following day with some presentation materials. You'll have access uh, to a recording of this event. Uh, we also have some treats in there as well. We have a couple of Excel models that uh, we thought we'd put together that you might find uh, useful in your own work. Uh, so before we jump into, uh, into the presentation tonight, I just want to tell you who's going to be speaking. Uh, I'm the old looking guy on the right hand side of, of your screen now. I'm Zach Miller. I'm a partner here at Our Crowd. I run the Investor Community. And what that means here is that I'm the person that typically uh, is in charge of marketing, bringing new investors on the platform, helping to, them to understand the investment process, uh, the risks inherent in investing in startups, which there are many, uh, and, and sort of the, uh, the potential for returns, uh, which there are great. So that's my role. I help to answer questions. You'll, if you signed up for the Our Crowd service, uh, we are an equity crowdfunding platform. You'll probably have gotten emails from me initially. I apologize if uh, they're voluminous, uh, but this is part of the process. Uh, we're opening up uh, startup investing to a lot of investors internationally. We have 26. We have inve active investors from over 26 countries around the world. Uh, some of them are very experienced in this. Other ones are new to the asset class. Equity crowdfunding is opening up an exciting world of investing in startups. We're focused on Israeli startups. It's very important to understand the process, and that's why we do these events tonight. Uh, the young guy and, uh, and the brain trust behind uh, this event tonight who will be joining me is David Stark. Uh, he's an investment associate here. He is a Wharton grad and spent uh, a few years on Wall Street uh, working for Blackstone in the, in the real estate group. Uh, he'll be talking more about the, uh, the investment process in particular. Uh, that's us in a nutshell. Uh, we're both available. I'll have my email address at the end if you have follow-on questions about how this all works. We're definitely available to answer questions. Uh, just a little bit about our crowd. We launched in February of 2013. Uh, since, with a focus on investing in Israeli startups. Since then we've expanded our, our model to invest in international uh, startups. We're looking, we, the four of the, our last ten investments that actually have taken place outside of the startup nation. Israel is still a focus for us. As we expand, we're going to continue doing more, uh, more investments internationally. We've raised uh, over $43 million for 36 different uh, companies in our portfolio. They're typically early stage investments. These are companies they're beyond idea stage. These are companies that actually have a working product, most of them, uh, the, that in, with beta customers, some type of traction in the marketplace. Uh, we're coming in and alongside some of the world's best uh, in, in um, venture capitalists as well, uh, names like Kosla and Battery Ventures. We're investing alongside them. There's an opportunity for individuals around the world to get access to those same types of deals that, uh, that professionals get. That's a little bit about us. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about the startup life cycle. Um, sort of We've, we've done an event previously. We had, a, we had great turnout for an event that actually walked through an investment that we made uh, from us doing due diligence, the whole entire investment process, uh, finding the companies, the, the system that David and his team had set up here internally to identify what we believe to be investable startups, all the way to us making investments, to making follow-on investments, to helping them get you know, bigger and larger and get traction, more traction in their own business to eventually exiting the companies. We've spoken about that before. Um, as our portfolio is maturing, and I mentioned we have 36 companies, a lot of our investors are trying to say, well, what next? Right? So I've, I've, owned, I've owned a company for you know, 18 months now. Uh, I'm starting to think about this company is doing well. The traction is going great. Business is, is picking up. You know, is this a takeout candidate? What's going to happen next in that process? And so we wanted to touch on a little bit of that uh, in this session. So before we d dive in, I wanted just to mention Jeffrey Moore. I'm probably dating myself here, but this was, this was a book I read in college, 1991. Uh, Jeffrey Moore is a management consultant. He wrote a book called Crossing the Chasm. Uh, and that, that was about um, technology companies and, and the marketing struggles and sort of the life cycle of, of a company. Uh, there was a chasm. I'll put up a, uh, a picture here. Basically what happens when a startup launches and, and has, to, uh, has to get traction relatively early to, to, to pay its bills, um, you, your target audience are, are what he called innovators and uh, at the next stage early adapters. So if you look at the slide here on the screen, the blue, uh, the blue bell curve is really 
is really identifying your ultimate target market. That's all people who could potentially be customers of your product. Um, obviously, when you have a technology company, you get a little piece of that initially. So if you're successful, you can land some early innovators, people willing to take a risk on your company. What happens according to Moore is that even if you're successful getting those innovators uh, buying your product and shelling out money for your product, what happens is at some point a company has to move from marketing to innovators to marketing towards like a much larger, more mature group of customers. And most companies, according to Moore, fail. They sort of fall into that chasm, if you can see, in between innovators and the early majority. What's interesting here is that investors also invest along this, uh, this timeline, and they do so in things called rounds. We had, an, we had another uh, teach in Tuesday that talked about sort of the different rounds. We typically do A rounds, which means it's not necessarily the first money into a, into a company. As a company matures and needs to get growth capital, there are different types of investors with different investment styles and mandates that participate in these different rounds. And ultimately, these rounds course correspond to different, if you see on your slide here, to sort of the different trajectories in the, in the company. So um, these are not exact, obviously, but if you, if you see our screen now, you can see like there's a seed round that happens when a company really starts. An A round comes after, you know, there's, there's and by the way, the axes here um, have to do with uh, momentum is, on, is on, the, uh, on the horizontal axis and on the vertical axis is visibility. So uh, for example, we're, we've, we've just invested and we're about to close around in a company called Consumer Physics. This is a company uh, Vinod Kosla invested alongside us. Uh, they're also launching a Kickstarter campaign. It looks to be it will be one of the most successful Kickstarter campaigns uh, in history. Um, huge, huge, you know, visibility off, off, you know, off the bat. So you would get that huge launch and that red line that you see there. Um, our investors have gotten an opportunity to invest early on. Um, the question will be for any company that, uh, that we invest in, are they going to be successful? We hope we're betting on them being successful and we're, we're working with them closely to help them be successful. Are they going to be successful moving from the innovator as a, as a target customer to the early majority? And if they are, that obviously spells very good things for the company and very good things uh, for the investors along for the ride. So that's just a, a, a little bit of an introduction uh, using uh, Jeffrey Moore's model of uh, these are technology diffusion curves. This is just sort of the normal life cycle of, of a company. Gardner has something as well called, I think, the, uh, the hype cycle. So it's, it's about the hype around some of these startup technologies. It's, it's the same thing as a technology diffusion curve. It takes time for companies to get, to get off the ground and, and, and build markets around themselves. Um, investors obviously want to um, stagger their own investments in a way that maximizes their, their own investments. And that's what the rest of our presentation is going to be about today. Uh, so I'm going to turn it over now to David Stark, investment associate here at, at our current, actually principal now, um, to talk about some of the startup math uh, to give you a feel for sort of what happens now if you were to travel along this red line, this curve, this technology diffusion curve uh, in relationship and in perspective of your investments. So here you go, David. Thanks, Zach. So as Zach just described, investors get into companies at various stages, and these different stages reflect different valuations. Now what's interesting is that in order to arrive at a company valuation, different methodologies are used depending on the company's stage. Uh, here at our crowd, we're actually uh, both sector and stage agnostic. So we look at, at companies that are in all stages of investment from seed uh, through pre-IPO pre rounds, and therefore we use a variety of methods. Um, and I'm going to walk through some of those methodologies here today. So starting off with kind of early stage investments and how we think about methodology, we've talked about this in some of our uh, previous educational webinars that with early stage companies, it really is more of an art than a science. Um, a lot of people say it's largely just a negotiation. The founder needs to raise a certain amount of capital and is willing to give up a certain percentage of his company, uh, and the investor eventually agrees or disagrees with those terms, um, and, and that's how the terms are settled. There are other kind of things, qualitative factors that, that come into play. Uh, one is, is that as a professional investor or, someone with, or even an angel with significant deal flow, if you're seeing a lot of companies out in the market, you could start to recognize patterns and you know, you know what valuations for comparable uh, companies in that same sector and geography should be, and therefore that can kind of anchor the valuation discussion. Other things that are factored in are the amount of competition, the, uh, the experience of the team, the level of kind of technology development that has already uh, gone in, and the amount of capital that the company will need to raise in the future. So those are kind of all of the 
less tangible uh, factors that go into uh, valuation considerations at the early stage. But there are also a number of quantitative approaches to determining valuation um, for early stage companies and obviously definitely for later stage companies. And none of these approaches are kind of uh, you know, gospel uh, on their own as a, as, as a standalone solution. But what we like to do here and what, what is pretty common for early stage investors is to use various approaches and, and, and then to combine them in order to you know, arrive at, at some sort of triangulated answer. So the first uh, method that I want to discuss is, is called the venture capital method. So the venture capital method um, is, is pretty simple. So the basic formula, which actually doesn't even appear on this slide, is that if you take the exit value of a company, divided by the post-money valuation of your investment, that will equal what your return on investment is. So giving a uh, numerical example, let's say that you invested in a company uh, with a $10 million post-money valuation. That company was bought for $50 million. So 50 divided by 10 would equal 5. So your ROI, your return on investment, would be a 5 times your money. Um, so then if you kind of use that and then manipulate the equation in order to back into what your valuation should be today, you can arrive at the equation which is today's post-money valuation should equal what you think the exit value uh, might be divided by what return you would like to expect. So again, if you think that a company uh, potentially is going to be worth $50 million and you know that you want to make a 5x return, so 50 divided by 5 would mean a $10 million post-money valuation. And if you're looking to invest uh, as part of a $2 million round into a company, so you would subtract that $2 million from the post-money and you'd arrive at an $8 million pre-money valuation. So if you look at the slide here, uh, you can see an example where I walk through the math. Um, and I'll just run through this really quickly. I want to note that all of the spreadsheets that you will see in this presentation we're going to make available to the listeners on the webinar. So we'll send out an Excel file uh, with various tabs that cover the different methodologies so that you can uh, play with these at home um, and use them. And feel free to send us any questions that you have. Uh, but just kind of running through from top to bottom here, what you, th what you think about is, okay, in year five, right, this is when the company will be generating substantial earnings uh, hopefully by that point. Here's what the earnings will be. Uh, here's the multiple on earnings that, that is common for that sector would be a, you know, a 15 multiple. I'd like to generate a 50% return over the life of my investment. So if I go ahead and I take uh, the 15 multiple times the earnings in year 5 of 2.5 million, and then I create the present value of that, uh, of that terminal value, it ends up arriving at a $4.9 million post money, um, which then when, when I back out the million dollar investment that I'm making today, I arrive, if you look at line 12, at a $3.9 million pre-money valuation. So that's, that's the first methodology. The second methodology, is uh, much more of a hybrid kind of quantitative and qualitative approach. This is called the Berkus method. The Berkus method was developed in the mid-1990s by Dave Berkus, who uh, is a well-known angel investor and speaker and author. Um, he originally developed this methodology during the dot-com boom. And the reason why that's relevant is because for each of these categories, he actually had assigned higher values initially to each driver. So it kind of was in the $1 million to $2 million range. And he later on in 2008, uh, given the market conditions, revised uh, this table down to you know, zero to $500,000 uh, in order to reflect those current market conditions. I would note that I actually think that given uh, where the, the market trajectory since 2008, I actually think that we're much more in a market environment that reflects kind of his, his 1990s math as opposed to his 2008 math. And I think that the valuations that you would use given this guidance of 0 to 500,000 uh, will likely be lower valuations than what are realistic in the market today. But the way, that you, the way that you think about this approach is that you go through each of these characteristics, which he identifies as the most important qualitative characteristics. So the first being a sound idea. Um, 
the second being a prototype, the third being a quality management team, the fourth being strategic relationships, and the fifth being product rollout. And you assign, you add uh, up to $500,000 to the pre-money valuation of the company for each of those characteristics depending on how developed you think that company is uh, in, that, in that category. So you know, at, at both ends of the extreme, you would give it a zero if, if they don't have anything at all. So in this example that I created here, if the company has no prototype, so you'll, you'll see a zero. Um, but if you think the management team is the most stellar management team you've ever seen, you'll give it a half a million dollars. Uh, and if you think it's somewhere in the middle, like I show here for Sound Idea, it would uh, appear as $250,000. You then sum all of those amounts and you arrive at um, kind of a reasonable uh, guidance for valuation. The next approach that I'd like to discuss is, is called the scorecard method. This is another hybrid uh, between qualitative and quantitative. And the first step with this approach is you gather valuations um, for other pre-revenue companies in this sector within your geographic region. So again, this is much easier if you are someone who has access to significant deal flow and you know what valuations are um, in that area. But what you do is you, you gather those valuations. So here in this example, uh, I took you know, the valuations of three comparable companies, com company one, two, and three. And then I took the average valuation of those three and arrived at a $2.66 million uh, pre-money valuation. Now, the way w the qualitative part enters into the picture is you've got various value drivers. Um, so again, some of them are very similar to what you see in the Berkus method, things like strength of team, size of opportunity, technology, uh, competitive environment. And there are different weights that are assigned to, assigned to those value drivers depending on how important of a factor that should be uh, in valuation. Now, the, the third column is the most interesting column, which is the venture score. So here what you do is you decide, well, how does the company that I'm looking at compare to the average company in the market for that particular value driver? So if you think the company is average in that, in that value driver, you would assign it 100%. If you think that it's above average, you might assign it 125, 150%. And if you think it's below average, you would assign it lower than 100%. You then, moving to the next column, you multiply the score that you assigned to that particular company. You multiply that times the weight, and you arrive at a factor. Um, so you take that factor, you take the sum of all of the factors for the various value drivers, uh, which in this example adds up to 1.23, and you multiply that times the average valuation. Because right? essentially what you're saying is, I think that you know, a factor of 1, right? if I gave every uh, venture score was 100%, so a factor of 1 would mean this company is purely average. So then 1 times 2.66 would, would equal 2.66. Here you're saying, uh, I actually think this company is above average as reflected by you know, my 150% and my 125s that I gave the company in some pretty significant categories. And then I arrive at a 1.23, which when multiplied by the average valuation gives a $3.3 .3 million uh, valuation for the, for the company. So those are all uh, approaches for early stage companies where you don't really have uh, financial performance of the company to rely on as a basis for the valuation. But as you move to later stages uh, and a company achieves meaningful revenues, what's common is to start to use the revenue kind of, uh, again, as the foundation for, for the valuation. And for various sectors, um, those revenue multiples differ. Uh, so just as an example, this is, um, this is from Fred Wilson uh, at um, Union Square Ventures. So he's recently written some blog posts about you know, different sectors and, and the multiples that he thinks are appropriate in those sectors. So taking uh, online marketplaces as an example. So he says, well, you can either look at it as one time the gross transaction value in the marketplace or 20 times uh, the company's earnings. And another example he gives is a software as a service company. You, you think about it as four times this year's revenue or three times next year's revenue. So once you have those financial metrics of a company because it's already at that stage, it's much easier to take that sector multiple and apply, uh, apply that multiple to that company in order to arrive at a valuation. Sometimes it's very hard to know what the multiple should be within a given sector. So we've actually provided here a link, and we'll send it out again. Uh, it'll be included in the, in the materials we send out. It's a link to a great source 
um, that's curated by a finance professor at NYU Stern who lists and keeps updating uh, revenue multiples by sector. So if you kind of want to go through this exercise on your own, you can look at that data uh, and use that in order to value mid-stage companies. And the last valuation method, which I'm not really going to go into now, is uh, for later stage companies. This is called uh, a DCF model, uh, uh, also known as a discounted cash flow model. So this is for a company when it's already profitable, and you're able to look at a few years of historical uh, performance, and then and then project out uh, growth assumptions for a five to ten year period, and then arrive at some. Uh, reasonable assumptions for terminal value. Uh, this is less relevant today in the venture space because we're seeing more and more venture-backed companies actually going public or being acquired before they even achieve profitability. Uh, but this is definitely a model that's uh, heavily used in, in later stage private equity. So moving on from, from valuations, uh, obviously once you've now bought into a company, and hopefully bought into it at a good price. The way that you then realize uh, some upside is by selling it at a higher price than, than, than what you bought it for. But what we want to discuss now is kind of what could happen in the middle in between the buy low and the sell high that could impact your financial return. So at each funding round, investors run the risk of getting diluted. This is a really important principle for people to, to understand, understand, especially people who are new to investing in early stage companies. What happens is at, at, at each round, um, the company is raising more money and therefore selling a piece of that company. And as they're selling a piece of the company, your slice of the pie is getting smaller and smaller. Now, the hope is that the overall pie is getting larger and larger. So it might just mean that you now own a smaller piece of something worth a lot more, so your overall holdings are, you know, could still be worth a lot more, but it's just important to realize that your share of the overall entity uh, will go down over time. So I, I now put together a, uh, a mathematical example of kind of this dilution effect. And again, this will be sent out. And here if you look at the, uh, if you look at this example, a company raises a seed round at $2.1 million pre-money valuation. And if you are an investor who puts in $50,000 as part of a $250,000 round, you end up coming away with 2.13% of the company. Now let's say the company goes ahead and they raise a Series A investment of $1 million at a $10 million valuation. Now they are effectively selling 9% of the company. Now what this means is that all of the existing shareholders will now be diluted by 9%. So let's assume that you don't do anything, and you don't participate in that round A. What will happen? So if you look down um, to the round A, no preemptive uh, scenario, you put in $0 in the round A, and your ownership percentage would go from 2.13% to 1.93%, which is 9% dilution. But what if you wanted to keep your holding at 2.13%? What could you do? So what you could do is you could invest an additional $21,277. Now the way you arrive at that number is you take your percentage of ownership in the company prior to the round, and you multiply it times the investment in that round. Because if the company is selling 9% and you want to keep holding 2.13%, then you need to own 2.13% of that 9% in order to maintain your status. Um, the I kind of walked through some of the implications of this down below. If you look at um, what your total investment would have been between the seed round and the A round, you would have invested $71,000. Um, but had you wanted to buy 2.13% of the company just at the A round, it would have cost you $234,000. So this kind of shows you the value of getting in at an early stage and then kind of, and continuing to protect uh, your equity share as opposed to trying to get in later and achieve the same equity target. Now dilution uh, in itself is, is, is not a bad thing. right? As, as we showed in those pie charts, if you're owning a smaller slice of something that's worth significantly more, that might be fine. And you might, 
you know, you might decide that you don't want to uh, participate in any sort of pro rata and continue to fund the company because you're already happy uh, with what your return picture is going to look like. So there, here's a quote from Paul Graham who says, if a company does really well, you eventually will get diluted because the valuations will get so high it's not worth it for you. Right? So at a certain stage, you're going to just accept the, the, the dilution because um, you're so happy about the performance of your earlier investment that the dilution doesn't really matter. That being said, it still is really important to reserve capital. And again, this is something that I think a lot of uh, first-time investors in the asset class uh, don't fully understand, and that's why I want to take a little bit of time to, to discuss this. There's two primary reasons why it's important to set aside some money um, before, while making uh, investments. The first one is uh, in the event of a, a rainy day situation. Now, I'm going to give an example that was actually given to me by a partner here at our fund, and this was uh, a true story about a company that he was invested in, where the company raised money at a $2 million valuation, and then a $5 million valuation, and then a 10, and then at 20. But because of the market conditions, uh, the company all of a sudden found itself going into bankruptcy. Now, luckily, the company emerged from bankruptcy. But the first thing that they did coming out of bankruptcy was they raised a million dollars at a $1 million pre-money valuation. So they were selling 50% of the company and essentially wiping out all of the investors that had been uh, invested in the company prior to bankruptcy. Now, what this partner told me was that um, some of the investors had not set aside any capital to be able to participate at a later stage. And when this million dollar round occurred, they weren't able to participate. And then they were especially upset with themselves when that company, a few years later, was bought for $200 million. So that's reason number one to reserve capital is sometimes for defensive reasons in order to avoid getting wiped out during a down round, you want to be able to put more money in uh, in order to protect yourself. Now the second reason is more kind of uh, in an optimistic scenario, which is the idea of doubling down on your winners. So if you make a bet and all of a sudden the odds change and they're even more in your favor, um, then it's, it's sensible to then want to press your bet and, and, and put more money in. Um, if you think about it, I'll give an example actually of one of our own portfolio companies. There's a company called Consumer Physics. So we invested in the first round, we invested at a, about a $4 million valuation. Um, and at that point, the company had significant technological risk and did not yet have market validation. Um, now we're about a, a, a year later, the company actually, and this is what the screenshot is of, just launched a Kickstarter campaign. Uh, as Zach mentioned, it's on track to be one of the most successful Kickstarter campaigns uh, in, in history. And I think it's given us a great sense of, of market validation, and now there's working prototypes. So in terms of the risk-reward profile, it seems even more attractive today than it did when we made our inv initial investment. So what we're excited about now is having the opportunity to double down on our bet on our investment from, from the earlier stage, and that's why it's important to have capital reserved. Um, I think that one thing uh, just to note is you don't need to think about reserving capital on a deal-by-deal -deal basis. You really should be thinking about reserving capital on a, on a portfolio basis. That's because you're not going to need to follow up every investment with additional investment. Um, a number of your companies are going to go bankrupt. That means you're not going to have to put more money into those. Other of your companies are going to take exponential leaps in valuation, and you're going to feel comfortable you know, not putting more money into those. But for the few companies where it's going to make sense to invest in, you want to make sure that you have capital. Uh, one of the guiding kind of principles that we like to tell our investors here is if you're investing $100,000 into, into startups, you should probably have about $50,000 uh, set aside for, for follow-ons. So that's uh, definitely something to think about. And uh, yeah, so Dave McClure, who's um, a well-known member of the venture community, the founder of uh, 500 Startups, he, in, in, in Moneyball for Startups, he actually describes this concept of doubling down on winners as invest before the product market fit and then double down after, right? Because you're not necessarily going to have an opportunity to get into that deal once the product market fit has been established. So the fact that you were able to get into that opportunity earlier um, and then at a, at a lower risk and be able to invest later uh, is, is a great opportunity. So now I'm going to hand it over to Zach, uh, who's going to now take us through kind of the exit process and 
We, we covered the math that goes into investing and the math that goes into what to do while you're, while you're holding your stake, um, and now we're going to think about how you actually make money at, at, at exit. Great. Thank you, David. That was, uh, David did a great job walking us through the, uh, the startup math. Uh, we always turn to him internally here in the office uh, for his opinion in terms of uh, the investability of a lot of our investments. Um, so so as, we, as David mentioned, we sort of walked you through uh, the first couple stages of investing, so identifying uh, you know, target opportunities, evaluating them and evaluating them, deciding what their valuation was. Um, this necessity to continue to or, or, or deciding not to participate in follow-on funding as, as these companies, these early stage companies evolve. Uh, the last stage is that is, is exit. As David said, that's what we're going to talk about now. And that's obviously where you, re you get your, your, your money back and hopefully get a lot more money back. Um, so one of the important tenets we talk about at our crowd, we've mentioned it already in, the, in this webinar, we've mentioned in every single one of our previous webinars, is the importance of portfolios. Uh, if, you, if you're an investor in the stock market, if you're an investor in real estate, uh, you're definitely familiar with the, with the idea, uh, the, the concept of, of risk diversification. So the idea of, of putting multiple, uh, you know, multiple securities into your portfolio to make sure you know, that no one investment can sink your, your returns. It's even more important in, uh, in, in early stage investing. Uh, as David said, you know, it, it's going to happen, and it, it, it's that you're going to lose money. You're going to invest in companies. They look great. You do your due diligence. You do your valuation work. Uh, something's going to happen. Maybe the market didn't work out. Maybe the, the founders didn't execute on their vision. Whatever the reason, they're going to fail, and those are going to be write-offs. Um, but given the portfolio effects uh, of, of, of having a diversified portfolio, and we'll talk a little bit more about what that looks like, um, you're, you know, you're going to have one or two winners, hopefully, that are going to end up paying you back you know, in spades uh, for all those losses. We had Mort Meyerson, uh, who's a well-known um, CEO and uh, chairman. He was the CEO of EDS. Uh, he sold EDS for multiple billions of dollars to, uh, to GM. He also was the CEO of Pro Systems, so sort of think about Internet 1.0 type companies. Uh, I think he said in the office he had made over a thousand, about a thousand investments, David, and uh, he basically, you know, 99% of them failed. He had two uh, that were multi-billion-dollar exits, and, and obviously uh, helped pay him back for all the uh, the losses that he had in his portfolio. There's a very interesting study. We we we. Uh, we mention it frequently in our, in our webinars here on Teach and Tuesday at our crowd. Uh, Professor Robert Wiltbank uh, did probably the most exhaustive uh, research into angel portfolios uh, to date. Uh, he did it in, uh, on behalf of the Kaufman Foundation. Um, and what he found was, which was really the headline, and obviously TechCrunch and every angel investor ran with this, you know, that, that investors, angel investors uh, who were diversified you know, saw a 2.5x return on their investment, 250% return. That was something in like three to five years. Great returns obviously on paper. But you know, the, the, the bigger takeaway again um, was that 90% of the returns to investors came from only 10% of the exits. So it's, the, it's those, you know, those black swans that Nisam Taleb talks about. It's those you know, one in a thousand type investments that are going to end up paying you back for many mediocre and subpar returns of, of, of the other investments. Uh, this is important. We, we tell all the investors at our crowd whether they invest with us or and get involved in angel investing in other wa wa ways, uh, they should definitely be looking at portfolios of 10 to 15 startups. So however you allocate uh, in your mind, you know, as a percentage of your overall portfolio allocation, you should definitely have in mind that you, know, you don't want to pick just one and, and, and let it ride that way. No matter, all the, no matter the due diligence you do, uh, the numbers are against you. So, so portfolio building is definitely the, the way to go here. That's our, that's our methodology. It's also methodology of some of the companies like David mentioned, Dave McClure, which does 500 startups. They put $50,000 into, you know, the idea was to, to create five, a portfolio of 500 different companies. And the idea is, you know, that sort of micro-investing is, is, is how to produce returns in this market. So, so how to identify a, a billion-dollar unicorn? Uh, this is something that's written about ad nauseum in, in the Internet. Um, obviously, if there was a formula, we wouldn't be sharing it. We would be, uh, we'd be 
keeping it uh, in, in very close to the vest and chest, we'd be you know talking to you from a from a from a you know from an island uh, in the Caribbean. But there are ways, uh, and there and you don't have to rely on our opinion. But the, the other experts have sort of posited ways to identify a billion dollar unicorn. I w we just wanted to share those briefly with you. Uh, during this call. So um, Paul Graham, who we've mentioned uh, previously, uh, he's the founder of Y Combinator, uh, which was a incubator slash you know, early stage investment uh, vehicle. Uh, he has since retired from day to day. But um, he, had, he had a great uh, quote that's up here on the, on the screen. The two most important things to understand about startup investing as a business are one, that effectively all the returns are concentrated in a few big winners. And two, that the best ideas look initially like bad ideas. Now this might cause a little dissonance. Uh, David, mentioned, David uh, who, who you heard right before I got on, uh, he's the one who actually bubbled this up to me. I hadn't heard it before. Um, so, so we sort of diagrammed it as well. Paul Graham, who, who, who was quoted, uh, actually learned this from Peter Thiel, who was who's the founder of uh, PayPal and uh, a couple other startups, and now is, is a very successful early stage investor. There are lots of bad ideas out there. Um, we see deal flow upwards of you know 100, 150 deals per month. Uh, the majority of them are, are you know we we can sort of filter out at, at first glance. They're, they're bad ideas. Um, and then there's obviously very clear good ideas. Um, and what Peter Thiel said is that he he felt that the the huge winners that he's invested in, uh, the PayPal's of this world that that netted investors billions of dollars, um, that's at that intersection where something at first sort of seemed to be a bad idea. Um, and ended up becoming a good idea over time, uh, and that's actually how he sort of sized up investments and, and how he uh, how he deployed his own capital. Um, so you know, ideas come to you at first may not set, may not look so good. You do your due diligence. Uh, a company that's successful in, in executing and, and uh, on its on its vision is going to end up turning what seemed to be a seemingly bad idea and sort of shook out other investors along the way uh, is going to turn and, and, and sort of mature into a good idea. And, that, and that's obviously where you're going to make your money. Um, so so if, you, if you're lucky enough to invest in an early stage company that gets to the point where, it's talk, where, where they're thinking about exiting, uh, this slide here sort of addresses the different ways that they can actually uh, get out into the market and help return capital to their to early stage investors. The easiest is, uh, and most understandable is a merger and acquisition. We see this here all the time here in Israel. Uh, the model here is to build uh, very uh, powerful technology. Um, to get it, you know, to build, to show that it has a viability in the market, to show some early stage customers, and typically what happened in the past is a large multinational would come in and, and instead of, you know, sort of developing this technology on their own, on their own would buy this, you know, this early stage company and, uh, you know, for a lower valuation, uh, and then sort of integrate it into into the larger uh, into the larger sort of uh, technology portfolio. So, so what happens there is obviously if it's a cash transaction, that's going to come back to you um, in the form of cash. If it's, it's a, if it's within stock, you're going to end up getting stock of the uh, of the acquiring company. Going public obviously is is a is a typically a smaller window. Fewer com fewer companies go public every year. Uh, you can do that through an IPO. Uh, so your company gets to a, a stage where it's 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 deemed viable to list on certain exchanges, stock exchanges around the world. Every stock exchange has different criteria that it looks for uh, in terms of companies qualifying for it to be listed. Uh, you'll see, you know, obviously the, the big boards in, in the U.S., the, the NASDAQ, and the New York Stock Exchange, uh, those are typically the, uh, the targets for, for many early stage companies. But we see, you know, a, as the global stock market business itself expands, we've seen consolidation. A lot of the bourses own each other, and um, we're starting to see you know, early stage companies list like in one of the London exchanges, which is a much earlier stage uh, uh, stock market. It gives, it gives companies uh, an opportunity to list maybe earlier than it would and to go on to the big boards. Uh, you also have aqua hires. Uh, you see this a lot, like the Googles, the Apples of this world. Sometimes they'll do that. They'll, they'll, they'll basically return capital uh, to early stage investors. Investors don't really see a large uh, return on this. It's more basically saying, hey, you guys are working on something interesting. Let's bring that team under our umbrella and let them do sort of their own uh, technology development as part of a penumbra of a larger penumbra of, the, of a bigger company. It's not great for investors, um, but that's it's it's good for entrepreneurs that that requires sort of the support of a larger ecosystem to start building their uh, their companies. And then there's soft landings. Soft landings is a nice way of saying that they're the sort of failures. You can see soft landings in one of two ways. One is you know basically either going through one of these three things, uh, either merger M&A, going public acquires where you. you 
given given the valuation, the dilution that's happened, uh, you basically get your money back. Uh, and then there are sometimes there are complete washes. There, there are companies that either go bankrupt and they, they just fail and they, they shut the doors. Uh, those are different types of exits. So we've had investors with us uh, at our crowd uh, who have gotten to the point where you know their, their portfolios are maturing, the companies are, are, are sort of hitting on their metrics. And you know they've, they've asked us, and, and that was somewhat, uh, to be honest, that was somewhat the, the impetus behind, behind doing uh, the presentation of the sort. Uh, so we just want to talk a little bit about how that would work. So what's interesting to note, um, you'll see a headline that a company gets bought out all cash. We talk, it's, a, it's an M&A. We just discussed that on the previous slide. Um, that money is not going directly back to investors immediately. So what typically happens is you know, 80, 75% of that will come in cash. Uh, a company will then keep you know, the remainder in escrow uh, as sort of as, as either on earnouts or, or just you know, basically to wait until the transaction, transaction finishes. That can be 12 to 18 months, sometimes at the long end. So investors are not going to see that. The rest of that money flow through right away. That money would flow through immediately. Uh, the, 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 big, the big corpus of that would flow through immediately. So that's just important to note if, you, if, if you're in a company that's going to be acquired for cash, just that you're not going to see your, your return immediately. Uh, as, if you're investing through Outcard or you're investing through another vehicle, um, fees are typically taken off at that, uh, you know, or, uh, up front. Uh, you're not necessarily going to pay taxes at source. The money is going to get, uh, you know, distributed out to you. And then depending on whatever jurisdiction you live in, whatever geography you live in, you obviously will pay capital gains on, on that money as it comes in. Uh, it's not taken out at source. Merger, that can happen, uh, you know, if a larger company comes in and, and, and acquires another company, you're going to get stock. That's gonna. That's gonna. You know, you're gonna end up. Your shares will be to convert into a, another company's shares. If those are public, that's great. Um, IPO. Obviously, with, you know, a lot of the companies that we're investing in are gunning for IPO. Uh, what's important to note here with IPO, it's great. You get. You get. Seemingly, you get liquid right away. Uh, it can be at a big valuation boost, as, as David mentioned before. Uh, but, what, but typically, there are restrictions in terms of selling those shares immediately. It could be a 90 to 180 day sort of lockup window. So the company goes public. You know, we saw this with Facebook and with Twitter. You know, Twitter went public very quickly. Um, huge valuation boost. Um, you know, in the first couple quarters of reporting as a public company, they sort of disappointed, and, and the value of your shares can go down. There's not really anything you can do with, about it at that point. Um, and dividends, which is one way for, for companies to return their money. There was, there was a billion dollar uh, a company here in Israel called Conduit. Um, instead of going public, they, uh, they, they actually issued early stage uh, investors large size dividends to pay them back for their investment. So there wasn't really a liquidity event. It was just that the company through their management decided to dividend out some of their money. Um, I'm going to turn it back over to David to sort of tie up uh, how all of this fits together, and then uh, hopefully there'll be, we have some questions that have come through already. If you have questions for David or for me, for either of us, uh, please feel free to submit those via the Ask a Question button in your Meeting Burner panel. Uh, I'm turning it over to David. Here you go. Thanks, Zach. So just to try to bring everything full circle, um, you know, we discussed how depending on what stage you invest in, it impacts the valuation, but it also impacts the exit scenarios that, that Zach just described and kind of what your expectations are for those exits. So if you're investing in, in a later stage company, then it's reasonable that uh, your return requirements would be, would be lower because the company at that stage has, has significantly lower risk. So you might think, okay, we're, you know, this company is raising around as a pre-IPO round um, I think I'm going to recover 2x with a reasonable amount of, of confidence within a short period of time. So that's okay, right? So for a later stage, kind of your, um, the return on investment that you need is lower because you're expecting a higher hit rate than with the early stage investments. With the early stage investments, as Zach mentioned, the vast majority of your returns are just going to come from just a few investments. So you're going to be looking for the big winners, which is going to influence your investment decisions and the valuation at the, at the time of investment. So it kind of is, is, is one, uh, one circle when you think about how what the exit potential is, and you know, do you want to move forward with this, uh, with this investment, and, and, and what the relevant price should be. Um, one thing that I'll just mention, because uh, I think it's important to point out, and this is something that we, we preach a lot around here, is that if you build a great business, the exit will sort itself out. Right? So Zach just walked through a whole number of uh, 
possibilities for, for exits for companies. But we always tell our portfolio company CEOs, focus on growing the business, uh, create value, uh, entrench your competitive advantage, and when you do that, um, either some acquirer is going to be interested in, in, in buying you, or the public markets will be interested in funding you, and don't kind of obsess over the exit. Obviously, at a later stage, as I mentioned, when you're investing, you do want to know, okay, the exit should be uh, on a more near-term horizon, and what are the likely outcomes. But for early stage investing, we really like to focus on, on the technology and the business model and how to scale this as a great business and, and to worry about exit later. So, one of the things that we do um, here at Our Crowd is we diversify across you know, all the various stages of uh, early, early stage companies. Just to give a few examples, you know, at the seed round, which is the idea phase, we've invested in companies like Zula and Curio. Um, there we felt comfortable investing at such an early stage because both of the founders uh, of each of those companies were serial entrepreneurs uh, who built and sold significant businesses in the past, and we were excited to be able to get involved at such an early stage. And then moving down um, to later stage, you've got Series A and B rounds. You've got companies like uh, Neverware and Avigilo that are already out in the market, already have sales, generating revenue. Um, and those companies, obviously, we then got in at uh, a slightly higher valuation than the companies in the seed phase. And then moving uh, forward again are the Series C and D rounds, companies like Argo, Aves Market, and Hicon. So each of these companies, when we made the investment, it was with an understanding of where they were on that development cycle that Zach uh, explained so well early on in the presentation. Um, and that informed what our expectations were, both in terms of the the duration of the investment and when we may, you know, might expect an exit down the road, and also, uh, you know, what our what a reasonable risk reward profile should look like for for a company at that stage. So, one of the things about our crowd is that by investing through our crowd as an investor, as an independent angel investor, you actually have the opportunity to benefit from the fact that we're creating that type of diversification. Um, and I'm actually going to hand it over to Zach now to talk a little about the, uh, the our crowd experience. Thanks, David. So, so hopefully you know, through, through the course of this presentation, you got a feel for uh, the three distinct phases of startup investing, the, uh, the idea generation, the identification of, a, of, a, of an investable opportunity, uh, sort of the ongoing necessity to can either continue to participate in investing or to sit on the sidelines. There will be multiple, most companies do uh, enjoy multiple rounds of funding afterwards, uh, and then the exit. And so um, our goal here is to help you support to help support all of our investors through that process as we work through, uh, through our portfolio. Uh, we launched in, in, in February 2013, as I mentioned before. We've invested in 36 startups until now. Uh, I think there's, all, there's also been you know, a, a similar, call it half, like 18 investments we've made our, were follow-on rounds. So even within that first year, companies typically go back and, and, and need to raise larger funds of money. Our, our goal is to help support the company uh, to exercise our preemptive rights, but then to help a company go and, and, and take an investment from a, mo a much larger uh, you know, sort of uh, private equity fund. So maybe it's a larger venture capital fund or it's a, or it's a strategic corporate partner. Uh, we're going to continue to invest alongside. Uh, we've invested over $43 million uh, in these firms. Us, when I say we, it's, it's us and our community of investors. We have over 4,000 investors from around the world uh, and from 26 different countries we have active, uh, actively, uh, you know, active investors deploying money on our platform. Um, it's important to understand that uh, there are different crowdfunding platforms out there. All have di sort of different flavors. We're not talking, obviously, about the Kickstarter, Indiegogo model. Those are donation-based. Um, some of our competitors have open marketplaces, so any company can list there and sort of use it as a marketing platform. The deals that, that we invest in and the deals that you end up seeing on, as an outcrowd investor on the website are fully curated. They're, they're, they're diligence by David and, and his team. Uh, we run them. We approach that very much as, as a, a typical venture capitalist would. Uh, we Sort of turn it. We combine what we believe the best of sort of the venture capital realm, which is that due diligence up front uh, and the continued continued support, business support of these companies as they as they grow. Um, but 
also layer in sort of this angel investment, you're not investing in a fund. You can sit and do the research on your own. You can identify opportunities that sort of fit your own profile and build that diversified for portfolio that we talked about previously. Uh, that, that's how we do it. And, uh, you know, there's plenty of examples of, the, of, our, of our portfolio companies on our website. Uh, if you haven't signed up for our crowd, definitely go and, and sign up there. It's for accredited investors only. Uh, so now we're getting to a point where we're hitting the, uh, the question and answer uh, section of our, of our webinar. Uh, I know we only have about five or six minutes left. There are a few questions that have come through. If you do have more questions, uh, definitely submit them uh, via the Ask a Question button in your, in your webinar panel. Uh, if for whatever reason we don't get to your question and we run out of time, uh, please email us and we'd be happy to, to answer them. Uh, you know, via email. Uh, we will send this presentation and a recording of this presentation around. As David mentioned, he actually was kind enough to put together some of these Excel models that we use internally. Uh, we'll make them available for you guys as well as a sort of a treat for, for attending the webinar. Uh, so, so let's just hop into, uh, into some of the questions. Um, we talked a lot about investing in Israeli companies, and that's up to date. That's been primarily our focus. One of the uh, attendees on the webinar says, "Well, what about overseas-focused companies? Are there, uh, David? Are there differences, I guess, in valuation, exiting opportunities? Can you sort of talk about what you're seeing, at least from a deal flow perspective?" Yeah, it's a great question, um, and I think it's well documented, uh, both in actual data and in you know just anecdotally that valuations in the in the states for example take you know silicon valley as as a market uh, or new york city are much higher than they are here in israel um, that's due to a number of contributing factors one being availability of capital uh, the second being that actually you know because operating costs are lower here in israel companies are able to operate uh, leaner and achieve you know, uh, comparable milestones with less funding. So those are some of the factors that influence the valuation. Um, and in, in Asia, we've actually seen, it depends on the sector actually, but uh, valuations feel pretty full in Asia today as well. Um, but I would say that right now we're kind of at a high tide across all geographies in terms of valuation, uh, in particular in, in certain sectors like uh, like, like cybersecurity is one example that comes to mind given uh, a, a meeting that I had today and was a little, had a little bit of sticker shock when they said what their valuation expectations were. Great. Thanks, David. Um, so, David, given, given the three methods of valuing uh, pre-revenue out companies, and, we, and you mentioned this is as much an art as is a science, um, do you typically prefer one method over the other, uh, or, do you, or does it depend on a case-by-case -case basis uh, depending on the available information about that company? Can you sort of address that issue? Yeah, I would, I would definitely say that for us it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, I'd be happy in the earlier presentations that we gave on, on this specific point, but there are a lot of factors that we consider when making investments. We actually have a six-point uh, investment checklist, which you could find on, on our blog and our crowd.com. Um, and we scorecard each of the deals that we do, and, and we, we do attribute value for, for different things. Um, so again, depending on depending on the team and what they've accomplished in the past, and depending on the proprietary nature of the technology, depending on how much has been invested uh, previously, depending on how much we think will need to be invested in the future, all of those things are, are, are factored in. Um, I would not say that there's kind of one method that we use. Uh, and I would even go as far as to say that uh, the point that I mentioned about early stage companies largely being a negotiation is, is, is pretty reflective of reality. Um, and our, our kind of stance always comes from our ex ex experience in the market and just really having our finger on the pulse of what uh, comparable companies' valuations are and, and whether we think those are reasonable. And I'll just mention there's kind of one other scenario, which is where we're not leaving an investment, but we're actually joining another institutional investor in, an, in a round. So there's sometimes we'll be meeting a company and they'll have a term sheet already from another VC and they'll say, listen, these are the terms of the deal, take it or leave it. And at that stage, is, you know, it's a little bit of a different exercise, and it's more, can we get comfortable with those terms um, given the various facts that, that we know? Uh, and if not, then, then, then we pass on the opportunity. But if so, then, then we join um, the previously negotiated term sheet. 
think that was a great answer. I, what, what, I, what I find interesting, uh, given, given uh, some of the different backgrounds here at our crowd, is although we're, we're focused on early stage investing, many of us, including David himself, uh, come from very rigorous sort of financial backgrounds. So David was looking at real estate, large real estate transactions uh, for Blackstone. Uh, another member of our team is Elon Zivotofsky, you know, was the Goldman Sachs equity analyst here in Israel. Um, we're really sort of providing this qualitative and quantitative layer, I think, on the type of uh, the research that we do. Um, we have time for, for one more question. Um, one of the investors asks, uh, asks are large size dividends one-time occurrence or are they ongoing? Um, I, I can take that. So, so the large size dividends typically are, are called in the industry in special dividends. Uh, these are typically one-time things. Uh, occasionally, they can, they, can, they can be taken uh, you know, multiple times. I, I can give you an example of, say, Microsoft every few years offers us, you know, they have a regular dividend that, that comes out quarterly, um, but occasionally when they build up cash, they will dividend that out via a special dividend. It's not the type of thing you can rely upon. Uh, investors typically like it because it's more cash back to them. Uh, companies, you know, in, public, in the public markets, you can return capital different ways. Um, than, than private companies, but typically those are, those are one size dividends. If you have companies that are just like cash cows, uh, like particularly in Israel, some of, the, some of the early stage startups that are now very successful are in the, uh, the Forex brokerage market, so a lot of those investors, those are, those are cash machines. Um, they will sort of special dividend out on a more regular basis. Um, I just want to address an issue I, I see here in the chat that um, somebody asked, is our crowd a fund that we invest in or do investors pick specific companies? Uh, that's my fault if that wasn't clear from the, uh, from the get-go. Our crowd is an equity crowdfunding platform, which really means uh, you can sign up at ourcrowd.com. There's, there's no cost. Uh, there's an accreditation form that you need to fill out. That, that's a legal regulatory issue. But you don't spend a single dime uh, until you find a singular investment that you like. We're not commingling funds. Uh, it's, it's your ability to pick and choose uh, in curated deals that we feel are investable. Um, and we do our best to sort of you know, bubble up what we think are the best investments. We invest in every single deal that appears there on our platform, uh, but definitely all the discretion is left in the hands of, of the individual investor. Um, so somebody asked as well, and we knew, that we knew this would be a good question. We were prepared for it. Uh, where do we see the the overall status of our crowd investments, the current status for each of the investments. Uh, I think what you mean is like where, you know, so what, where can you view our portfolio? Uh, that is clear on our, on our website. Um, if you sign up at our crowd and you log in, there's two sections if you go to the Browse Startups page. One is sort of our actively, uh, currently investing companies. Those are actively funding companies. Uh, there's also a sort of a closed section where you can get a, a, see a tombstone and get a little bit of information on all the companies we have already invested in. Uh, there's, there's, if you, do, if you do sign up and you log in and, and you look at the actively investing companies, you'll find uh, a summary of, of the due diligence that David talked about that he, he and his team put into each company. You'll get a video about the company with the, with the entrepreneur describing the opportunity in his own words typically. Uh, you'll get a summary of the deal terms as well, same deal terms that our credit itself is investing in. The same deal terms are shared with, with all of our investors. There's a, there's a plethora of information there that you can get. It's pretty robust. Uh, we've put a lot of time into the, uh, the research that we put into our companies, and we publish most of that in the hour take. That's a summary of our due diligence materials. That's a very valuable document, and I think uh, that's something that you can learn a lot about the industry and the investment opportunity as well. I think with that, um, we've, we've reached our full allocated hour. Uh, I'd like to thank you for spending uh, your time with us. This is, obviously, we know your time is valuable. Uh, we enjoy these sessions uh, when we do them. Uh, David and I do these together. Sometimes we'll invite in sort of a sex sector expert or sort of a, a topic uh, expert. Uh, We'd love to hear your feedback on these events. If you like the topics, if there's other things you'd like us to uh, to address, we're happy to. Um, these these are for you guys to get to, to get uh, smarter, and uh, we're happy to share the information that we've uh, we've built so far. Uh, our crowd's been up since 2013. We're doing a lot of new things, and we're and we're sharing out that information with you guys. Uh, David just reminded me as as we close out here. Um, this presentation, which, which David and I uh, put together, will be shared. We'll send it out to you. We'll send you a link uh, to the video as well. Uh, and David put together, as I mentioned, this, uh, this Excel workbook uh, that has you know, some models for some of, the, some of the tools that we use here. We're happy to share that with you guys as well. We'll, we'll, we'll put a link to that as well. Thank you guys for, for attending. And uh, if you haven't yet signed up for our crowd, please go do it. And uh, we have another session in, in, in two weeks, which we're going to be talking about the cybersecurity market. If you have an email or you've seen that link, uh, 
let, let us know. We'll make sure you uh, you get it. Uh, we've already got you know 100, 200 people signed up for that. Um, we'd love to have you attend that one as well. That will be uh, that will be led by one of our mentors here at our crowd, uh, who's a cybersecurity expert. Talk about sort of the entire field of cybersecurity, which obviously is very hot both in the world and in, in Israel specifically. Uh, with that, I'm going to sign out for Teaching Tuesday. This is Zach Miller at our crowd, and uh, we'll catch you again soon. Bye bye.